we're, we're finishing up the Psalms in a couple more weeks. Uh, we're in Psalm 148. Uh, and when you think about this particular uh, praise psalm, uh, you got to stop and go back, because I did it. I have a Hebrew-Greek uh, program where I can go through and do all kinds of stuff. Uh, so one of the things I did, it took me a while, is I counted uh, every time uh, you're called to praise God based on this particular formula that you find in uh, this particular psalm. How many times did, are you called to praise in, in the Psalter? It's everywhere. I mean, it, it took me a while. It's 121 times. And it begins, the, the, it begins that way, and it ends that way. Here, here's the, the first time the word praise occurs in the Psalter is in Psalm 7, verse 17. Uh, this is a, like a, a, a psalm. It's like an imprecatory psalm where uh, David's calling for God to deal with his enemies who are opposing him as a king, as a politician, as a godly man. Uh, and as he's dealing with the emotion of being opposed uh, in a hostile culture, he says in verse 17, first time it appears, uh, I, he says, as a godly man will do what? I'll give thanks. Uh, uh, and, and to the Lord according to his righteousness. And he says, I will sing in this hostile time uh, to the name of the Lord Most High. Uh, we've already covered Psalm 7. I'm sure you know it in, intimately well. Do you remember it? Yeah, it was, it was a while ago. Uh, so he here promises to, even in his difficult situation, to give, give God thanks. And he says, I'm going to do it according to his righteousness uh, because he's looking for God to bring justice to those who oppose holy things and and. He's saying, you, you, God can do this because you're righteous. And because God's righteous, that means his, just, uh, his judgment is always just. So he's saying, God, move in space-time history to come into my life and deal with those who are making my, my life miserable because I stand for godly things. Sound familiar? He says, God, be righteous. And then he, then he says, uh, I will praise the name uh, of the Most High. Uh, and this is just uh, denoting God's position as the King of Kings. He's on his throne. He's always on his throne. Uh, and he's in a high position. It's a lofty position. So uh, outside of time, our version of time and space, our dimensionality and its limitations, in God's dimension, how, whatever that is like, uh, his vantage point allows him to see all things. Uh, so he says, I can praise you, God, even when I'm being attacked for my faith, because you have a high lofty position. That's praiseworthy, isn't it? That no matter what's happening to you, wherever you're working in, the, in this area that can be extremely uh, anti-Christian, you can always have great faith and praise God because his eye is always on you. Uh, and remember Jesus said, if, if I take care of little sparrows, well, aren't you worth more than a little bird? And the answer to the question is, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and so 121 times uh, we're called to praise God. So the, the Psalter uh, uh, ends in uh, Psalm 150 with verse 6. And here's how the Psalter ends. He says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then he says, one more time, i got to say it again. I'm so excited. Praise the Lord. I know it's early. You're not totally going yet. Two or three cups of coffee in you. You're not feeling quite charismatic Pentecostal, but it will hit you later. Yeah, I totally. Praise God. Yeah, praise God. Yeah. So he said, praise, praise the Lord. Everything that has breath. So what does that mean? Yeah, every, everything. Yeah. Uh, every, everything that has breath. If, and we're going to get into this in just a minute. Uh, it should praise God. So, so what were you created for? Oh, you guys are so intelligent. This, these are softball questions, are they not? Um, so were you created to work? Well, to a degree, uh, yes. Uh, to enjoy sports? Obviously. Um, uh, to pour your life into travel to warmer climates? Yeah, well, that was good. Uh, to stay in great shape? Especially this church, right? You got PT exam coming up. You got, I, I hear this all the time. So you were, you were created to do all these things, but as your, is that your primary reason why God made you? No. Primary reason why you were created was to give praise to God. And so uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, am I doing that? Do I praise God? Uh, when, and if he were to evaluate me, would he be able to tell on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 is I praise him a lot, 1 is I complain a lot, where would I be on the grid? A little convicting, we're moving on. So what are the reasons for praising God? So uh, this is what we looked at, and review's a wonderful thing, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it is, because we forget stuff, right? And so uh, we want to review, just quickly, uh, the first nine verses, he tells you what are the reasons for praising God, and the, he, there's only two points in this whole 21 verses. The first nine verses are you should praise God be, because uh, he's uh, the Lord of a kingdom, his kingdom. So all earthly kingdoms come and go, but his kingdom always is. It always shall be, and we'll dig more into that later, but we, we talked about that in detail. Um, nothing trumps his kingdom, and, and as we were reviewing, we remember the Lord's prayer that we we're told by the Lord how to pray, 
because it's a kingdom prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, his domain, his vantage point, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. And then we pray, thy what? Thy kingdom come. What kingdom? His kingdom. May it intersect and, and overpower all the, the sinful earthly kingdoms and be the kingdom that will come. Uh, and so, so we praise God because he's the God of the kingdom, not a kingdom. Now, we want to, that's just review. We want to dig into the second reason why we should praise God. Uh, and that's in verses uh, 10 to the tw verse 21, where he says, we should praise God for his care. He's a God of great care. Now, you would think that a God who's in charge of taking care of the entire cosmos. I mean, when you study just the immensity of the cosmos, and I mean, the question always comes, why do you put that stuff so far out there? I mean, some of our telescopes can't even reach it. You know, I mean, you would think a God that had uh, created something that massive would be busy taking care of it. So busy that you got your little prayer down here. Why would he be paying attention to you? Well, because he said he's a God of great care. So uh, God is that busy. Uh, it, it's mind numbing to think that's all, all that's on his plate. But in, in distances we can never traverse uh, into the deepest uh, parts of the ocean. And if you're a submariner, do we have any of those here? We have some. For, are you presently? Are you, some, some of you were former submariners. I know who you are. Yeah, so you go under, and I asked a Navy captain one time who was leaving here to go to the sub base in San Diego where I'm from. I asked him, how deep can a United States submarine go? He just stared at me. Oh, it's classified. It's weird, pastor, in here. You know, I mean, I got to know as your pastor, but no, I can't tell you that. Um, uh, so anyway, back, back to my sermon. You could go, what are the depth is that a U.S. sub can go to? 1,000 feet. 2,000 feet. God there? I'm asking these two guys. Yeah, sorry. Don't, don't ask. Is God there? You're in your bunk. Yes, he's there. Yes, he's there. And does he care for you even when you're down there? Yeah, absolutely he does. So we want to look at that. Let's dig into verses 10 to the end of the chapter and look at two things as we look at God as a God of care. We praise him for his care. Number one, uh, he's going to answer the question, uh, who, who praises God for his care? Verse 10. All thy works uh, shall give praise to thee, O Lord, and thy godly ones shall bless thee. So who praises God? So works, uh, the particular Hebrew word for all thy works, uh, ma'aseh is the Hebrew word. Uh, this, speaks that, this speaks of literally everything that God has made. So I did a little uh, word analysis and traced that Hebrew word throughout um, the Psalter to see how, how else does uh, the Psalter, David, use this word, uh, and, and how is it used in other contexts that... Uh, the, the works of God praise him. Uh, it's very interesting. Psalm 138, verse 14. Same word occurs, says this. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. So works, what is the work? The, the baby in the womb, the embryo that God is making. Again, this is one of the reasons why we are pro-life. Because who's making that in the womb? God. God help the person who messes with that. It's the handprints of God. And so he says, should, should, if, if the child that's in the mother's womb could speak, what should it be doing if it was possible? You probably don't remember if you did this in the womb, praise God, but you should be praising God. Uh, another place that it, it occurs uh, is in Psalm 140, or 104, verse 13, where he says, uh, he, God, waters the mountains uh, from his upper chambers. Um, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. So you ever go hiking in the mountain ranges and, and clouds come in and it rains and it's beautiful and everything? Uh, you can think about it from a scientific perspective as to why that happens, but, but who's really the glue and the mind behind why there's a system like that on this planet? God. And so he says, uh, e even the mountain ranges, if they could speak, should praise God. And this is similar to what Jesus uh, said, uh, that inanimate objects uh, would praise him if people did it. Remember? Triumphal entry. He's riding into town on a a donkey for humility. Psalm 19, uh, the Pharisees have castigated his, uh, uh, his disciples uh, for allowing people to praise him. Uh, and Jesus uh, turns and answers and says in verse 40 of Luke 19, he says, I tell you, if these, the people there in his triumphal entry, uh, become silent, the stones will cry out. I have a question. Does a stone have a mouth? You've, you've analyzed stones in your yard? Yeah. I used to be a landscaper. I've moved lots of stones. None of them talk to me. That's when you know you need to retire if the stones are talking. But, uh, whoa, wow, it's amazing, man. Uh, 
Yeah, no. Uh, no, Jesus said it's so important to praise God, the Messiah, that if these people stop praising me, and there are lots of rocks in Israel. They're everywhere. He says, if these people don't praise me, all of these rocks around here are just going to start singing praise to the Messiah, which tells you just how important it is. So in, from a literary perspective, we would call this personification. You're taking an inanimate object, and you're making it act like a human, right? Right? You're with me? or Okay, you're still with me. Good. Uh, Isaiah 55, uh, verse 12, talks about the cosmos praising God. Um, it says, for you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, speaking of the Messiah, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Uh, so this is a messianic context, and what he's basically saying, if you study the context, is when the Messiah comes and, and he rids the, the earth of evil and sin, how does the created order respond? If, if, if a tree could clap its branches together, they would. Trees are Pentecostal. Did you know this? I'm just saying. They get with it. The more stilted trees are Episcopalian or Presbyterian or something like that. But, you know, but if they could actually move and get with it, they'd be going, whoa, Messiah. Because what's up with the tree? No more decay. No more lichen on the, you know, on the north side of the tree face. Uh, no more uh, bugs born into their you know, trunks. Free. Free. They're clapping. He's here. He's here. So I would put it to you this way. If, if all thy works refers to everything that God has made, if all of those inanimate objects uh, could, as it were, praise the Messiah when he appears, and all those things were, were, were doing that in a way now, well, then what should you be doing? Praising God. So I'll just think about this for just a moment. Could it be that every time, and I, I love the wind moving through the tulip poplars in my backyard, because they're about 100 footers. They dwarf my house. I'm constantly thinking, if they ever blow over, God, guide him this way, you know, away from my house. But I like to sit in my back patio when the wind's blowing, not when it's 20, but when it's a little warmer, just hang out back there and listen to the wind going through the trees. It's just therapeutic. And I often think, you know, if, is that the tree praising God? You know, let me think about it. When it gets a little bit warmer and you hear all those little crickets outside your window that wake you up in the middle of the night, you're like, what is that? And they're singing their little tune. What are they saying? I, I, I can't translate cricket language, but it, they're probably saying praise God. They praise God. I mean, just think, I mean, it, built into the cosmos is that rhythm of praising God. So if the created order outside of man is supposed to be praising God uh, in their own way, then what should man be doing? Well, they should be following suit. He uh, says here in verse, we're still in verse 10, by the way. We move slowly. Uh, he, he says, uh, thy godly ones shall bless thee. That's the New American Standard version. Thy godly ones. Um, this is a... Uh, the Hebrew word is chesed, uh, which is from chesed, and chesed is the word for loyal love. I mean, that's what the word really means. So he says, those who are really loyal to God should be praising him. Well, what's that mean? And by the way, uh, the NIV has a better translation here, where it translate this, translates this, that the faithful people should be praising God. That's a better translation of the Hebrew word. So what, what does it mean? It means that anybody that's maturing in their walk with God, you know they're maturing because they're doing what? They're praising God. If they complain, they gripe, everything's negative, that's not a spiritual gift, right? That is not. What should they be doing? How do you know a person's growing up in Jesus? Because their praise just flows from them. Great things happen to them, they praise God. Uh, hard things happen to them, they still praise God. Because he said that is what should be done. So who should be praising God? Um, well, all of those who love him and walk closely with him. Now, I want to get into, because he gets into it big time in verse 12 and following, well, what about his praise, is, uh, his, uh, his care is praiseworthy? We're supposed to give him praise for what he does for us, but, but exactly what? So he's moving down the ladder of abstraction. All those who really love God should be praising him. Now let's move down the ladder of abstraction. E exactly what are you talking about? So let's look at him. He gives us multiple answers to that question. What about God's care is praiseworthy? So number one, answer number one. His care is wedded to divine power. Uh, verse 11. They... They, the godly ones, that's you, uh, shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men thy mighty acts and the glory of thy majesty of thy kingdom. So he, several times here, he tells you, if you are a maturing Christian, you should be praising God and you should be letting people know that you're praising God. Not, not just silent all the time. You're, you're communicating his greatness because you're talking of his divine power, um, God's power. Is this power limited? You sure? 
we must consider. This is not a softball question. So let's look at uh, Wayne Grudem, who has a systematic theology called Bible Doctrine. Uh, he says concerning God's omnipotence this. He says God's omnipotence, omni, you know, all potence, you know, power, uh, means that God is able to do uh, all of his holy will. The word omnipotence is derived from two Latin words, omni, all, and uh, potence, meaning powerful or all powerful. There are no limits on God's power to do what he decides to do. There are, however, some things that he cannot do. Well, God cannot will or do anything that would deny his character, correct? Uh, and for example, he cannot lie, Titus 2.13. Although God's power is infinite, he uses that power uh, in a qualified way, which is adjusted to his other attributes. Translated, God cannot defy who he is. So he cannot do things that are contrary to, he cannot do something immoral. So is his power unlimited? Well, it depends. He is unlimited in his power to do those things that match his will and his character, but he won't do things contrary to his will. That's awesome. Because we do things contrary to our will all the time. And, right, don't you? Today, I'm going to get up, I'm going to serve God and, think of, and be a Christian all day long. How do you do? All you have to do is just drive on the road. That's it. That's just testy right there. See, aren't you glad that God is omnipotent? Because he's on his throne, high vantage point, he can then use his power to then intersect with your life to help you. He's all, he's all powerful. So think about this. No limits to what he can do with his power should, should he decide to move. So let's think back through it. So think about your life experience right now, whatever your life experience was. Uh, since we have a big military church, I know a lot of you went to the Naval Academy, West Point, um, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy. There's a bunch of academies. Uh, did, I, did I miss any? I'll hear about it if I did. So please tell me now. What, which one did I miss? The Marine Corps. Yeah. I may not be alive for the next service, but, <laughs> but, but if you think about it, when you got out of the academy and you graduated from boot camp, all that you did, if you're a believer following God, can't you stop right now? We could probably have testimony right now that the power of God moved you and worked in your career. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's exactly right. When you, when you get, become an older man, like we were just talking about before church, we who are born in 1957, you can, you can look back, you can look back and go, man, I didn't know it when I was 22. That was the hand of God. And then, then you look, man, back in, thir when I was 30, that was the hand of God. When that happened, I, I thought I was gonna make rank there, but I didn't make it, I got all upset, but then God moved me here and this happened to me. And you look back and you go, he is omnipotent, is he not? So why should you praise him? Because he did omnipotent things in your life now that you can see his, his, his amazing ways. Um, his power, think about it, set up the complex events in your life so that you, you could meet her. I mean, who? Upstairs, they get it. Well, so you can meet her. And God set up the complex events with his, with his omnipotent power so you could meet him. Well, my daughter always said, Dad, how did you know Mom was the one? Oh, I knew. I knew. And I, I knew. Did you know? I knew. I mean, and so did my wife. My wife wasn't even a Christian when I met her. And, and after our first date, she, her mom said, well, how was that? And my mom, Liz thought I was kind of a book nerd, college guy, you know, when I first met her. She's a non-Christian. And um, she told her mom, she goes, well, I know I don't like him, but I know I'm going to marry him. <laughs> That's what she told her mom. Now, I've been married 41 years now. Thank God. She forgot about that conversation. But yeah. But anyway, but when you say that's the power of God, God I, didn't, I didn't date non-Christian girls. I did not. But when my dad moved with the you know, uh, U.S. Customs, ICE, to do his job as a director, and he called me in L.A. in San Diego, he called me in L.A. He goes, there's beautiful girls next door. There's twins. Take a pic. Come home. <laughs> I got home, and they're, they're not Christians. I did that whole date and lead them to Jesus thing. And, and she, she got saved, and I'm like, whoa, she looks nice. And poof. But anyway, moving on. It's too personal. But... But I'm just sharing with you to just say, when you look back at your life and you go, the fact that my parents left El Centro, California, and my dad moved to San Diego to take this job in the federal building with customs, and I was in L.A. going to school, and then there's five to girl, girls to every guy at Azusa Pacific University. I told my dad on the phone, why would I want to come home? This is heaven. He's like, son, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you need to come home. Summer 79, I did. Poof, I found out about the power of God. Anyway, moving on. So I'm just telling you, uh, if you're thinking here, eh, it's kind of academic, I don't know, divine power, I don't see it, uh, open your eyes, open your eyes. 
Uh, you should speak up and out of, about his, his power, how he did things in your life. It could be even like uh, we were a childless couple, and God guided us to our son that we adopted. If you think back now, it's like, wasn't his power evidence in all of the things that happened to guide you to that child? Absolutely, right? That's the way God works. Number two, answer number two, why is God's care praiseworthy? Well, because he's there and his kingdom's there. Think about it. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endures throughout all generations. You know, think about, because we live in D.C., we're surrounded by politicians and, and political life, are we not? Four people know this. It's kind of scary. Yeah, it's just like, it's everywhere. Uh, but, but one thing that you learn is like, they're in office, they're out of office. They're in office, they're out of office. It's kind of, it comes and goes. You like him, you don't like him, you don't like him, you don't like him, you don't, you like him, and you know how it goes? Um, but when you think about God, he's always in office. But, but that's what it says. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Can you imagine if, well, I'm only around for four years. And you can vote me out if you don't like some of my decisions. No? No, he has a perfect kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom. And it endures throughout all generations. So if you think about Joseph thrown in the pit by his brothers because they don't like him, left him there to die, the king of care was with him in the darkness. Yeah, in that generation. Uh, when the disciples, many years later, thousands of years later, fought among themselves uh, in Luke 22, verse 24, fought among themselves as to who would be the greatest among the, what a lame discussion. Who would be the greatest? No, Jesus said you should be fighting for the bottom, not the top. But the king of care was with them, was he not? Generations later. When John is exiled on Patmos uh, in his old age and, um, and left, you know, left to die there, eventually got off the island, but He's left there. It's where he got, God was with him. The king of care was with him. Thousands of generations beyond whatever happened in the Old Testament. See, the king of care is always there because his, his kingdom is everlasting. And that should give you great hope uh, because that kingdom is there and that king is there to care for you in profound ways. Number three, his care uh, is praiseworthy because he's not restricted. Uh, verse 14, the Lord sustains all who fall, raises up all who are bowed down, the eyes of all look to thee, and thou dost give them their food in due time. I'm reading more from a King James Version. You have the more colloquial English version. I should probably read that one. Uh, you open your hand and you satisfy who? Every living thing. Now, you've got to think about this. I had to give some contemplation to this. There's some verses that you encounter when you're reading the Bible that kind of make you, like, theologically uncomfortable. So you just like to skip those. Did you ever do this? Like, I really don't understand that. I'm just going to bypass that one. Uh, so I was reading these going, okay, we, why is God's care praiseworthy? Well, it's because it's not restricted. And I'm reading this thinking, hmm, well, is it true that he stain, sustains all who fall? And I'm thinking, well, I can think back through biblical history of people who fell either because of their own sin or because God judged them. They fell. Uh, he wasn't picking them up. Okay. Uh, I can think, think of people who are bowed down, and the, the whole concept here is bowed down through oppression like sickness and things like that. Well, I can think of people in my own family life that have been bowed down that were never released from said disease. Uh, how does this apply? Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, like, uh, do all eyes look to thee? Well, from what I know in systematic theology, as it arranges the whole doctrine of sin, homartiology, when I study that whole doctrine, I understand from Romans 3 that all men pursue evil. That's what Paul argues. Man hates the light and, and goes toward the darkness. So, how do, I, how do I process this? It's problematic, isn't it? So how I look at it is, uh, I think it's like a, um, I think it's a hyperbole. Because they use figures of speech, and you use figures of speech when you speak, right? What does hyperbole mean? You're going to what? You're going to exaggerate this. You probably do this with your children. When they do something wrong, you make some kind of grandiose statements that, wow, if the police ever heard this, you know. But there's just no way. It's just hyperbole. It's hyperbole. So I think it's hyperbolic to a degree because he's trying to, what he's trying to do is he's trying to emphasize that God's care is not restricted on the planet. Right. Because if it was restricted on the planet, he could be looking down going, well, I'm only going to bless red states. Those blue ones, they got issues. Or the opposite. I'm only going to bless the blue states. And I'm not, the red states, they have issues. See what I mean? He could do, the, oh, oh, you're a Democrat, I'm not blessing you. You're a Republican, I'm blessing you, or the reverse. But what he's doing is he's looking at it in a hyperbolic way to just emphasize the fact that his care is so great, he doesn't care who you are. 
that there are times he will reach into your life and he will bless you. Uh, I mean, it, it's mind-boggling. I mean, think about um, Myers-Briggs personality inventory. You probably had a few of these done on you, correct? Uh, I mean, think about that. Um, there are 16 different personality types. Do you like all of them? <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm saying? When we interview people for jobs and they're, they're a certain person, they're not going to fit here. You know, it's just, it's not going to work. Um, like, because you drop a laissez-faire kind of person into a high type A personality group, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be rough. Not to say you can't hire them, but, you know, it's just, you, imagine if God, who knows the Myers-Briggs intimately because he created you and your personality. Imagine if he looked down and said, oh, you're number 14. Can't help you. No. No, God says, I'm, you know, you're wired that way? Okay, I'm, I'm with you. I can help you. So the point being, in a hyperbolic way, uh, God is just emphasizing the fact that his care is not restricted because we restrict things. Oh, you don't believe it like I do? I'm not doing X, Y, Z for you. That's how we roll. God says, I don't roll like that. I created all things. I care for all things. Um, Job 38, verses 39 to 41, when Job's having a whole contest with God, and he's like, God, if you just show up, I can argue my case that I'm a just man suffering unjustly. And God finally shows up. Read it, because he comes in a whirlwind. Is that a positive sign for Job? <laughs> uh, no. And, and God tells him, basically, where were you when I did X, Y, Z? And in, in Job 38, 39 to 41, God says, I'm taking care of animals in the middle of nowhere on hillsides you're not even aware of. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of them, but Job, I'm taking care of you too. See, his care is not restricted. I'm glad his care is not restricted. And because his care is not restricted, I can say, God, I can praise you for the fact that your, your reign reigns on the just and the unjust. Right? Uh, answer number four. Uh, his care is praiseworthy because he's fair and kind. It kind of logically follows. The last point. Verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, and he is what? He's kind. He's kind in all his deeds. See, um, when you think about um, Paul... Paul had a, a thorn in the flesh. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12 talks about it. Prayed three times for God to remove it. Uh, it it's probably a, an eye disease that he contracted in Pamphylia, uh, southern Turkey, uh, when he was on his first missionary journey. It affected his eyesight, so he was going blind. So three times he said, I, I can't pastor and minister and be a missionary if I can't see. So God, would you remove this from me? Uh, and God says three times, no. And then he tells Paul, you know what he tells him. My grace is sufficient for you. Wow, I still get chills thinking about that because, because it is true. So sometimes God says, um, well, all my ways are righteous. And he, Paul could say, Lord, it is most righteous that you lift this in me because he, he tells Paul why he left it in him. He says, Paul, your gifts, your spiritual gifts are so great. If I did not humble you somehow, you would be incorrigible and ineffective. So I will give you these things because I'm kind to mold you to be the man I want you to be. So when we think of kindness, it's, well, he only does things to me that I positively like. And God's, oh, uh, no, no. Sometimes I do things that are hard and difficult because I'm shaping you into be the woman or the man that I want you to be, to do great things for me. See, he's, he's kind like that. He's kind like that. Do you praise him for that? Do you praise him for all of his deeds? Uh, John chapter 5, uh, I, I teach when I go to Israel with people. Uh, we take them uh, to the pool of uh, Bethesda because uh, we know what happened at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, there was a lame man there waiting uh, uh, to be healed. And there was the proverbial stirring of the waters. And they had a thing in rabbinical teaching when the waters were stirred, an angel was doing it. And if you got in the water, you got healed. So everybody's waiting for that to happen. Uh, and, well, the, Jesus shows up. Uh, and he basically looks at the, the lame man and he tells him, take up your bed and walk. Are you kidding? Who are you? Well, I'm the creator who made your legs. I'm giving you new legs today. You have to stop and think about it. I've thought about this before. The whole, read, read the passage in, in John 5. It, it says that there were many there paralyzed, blind. There were many there. How many did he heal? One. It leads to another question. Does that mean that Jesus didn't care about everybody else there? No. No. His sovereign will and kindness was directed toward that one man who was positioned to be there sovereignly by God for that one event. Now, who knows what that event did in the lives of all those other people there that had needs? Who knows? We don't know until we get to heaven. See, it's not for me to judge, but, but I know the Lord is kind, and he was kind to that man that day, and that, that witness became kindness shown to the, everybody through that amazing... Can you imagine uh, the guy who's been 
you know, unable to walk for, I think at the context says 38 years, and you know this guy, and you go home and you tell your parents, we don't know what the guy's name, we'll call him Yehuda. It's a Hebrew name. And when you're telling him, hey, mom, you can't believe it. I mean, Yehuda was there, I mean, as usual, and he got up, huh? Yeah. And he was leaping around. It was unbelievable. What happened? Some guy named Jesus came and just told him, you can get up today. Well, that's amazing. That's the kindness of God. Stop and think about the kindness of God that he's evidenced in your life, and do you thank him for it, whether it's a positive or negative thing? Give him praise. Number five, his care is praiseworthy because he's focused and favorable. Uh, it says, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call, upon his, who call upon his name in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry, and he will save them. He's talking here specifically to his people. Because uh, I'm a father, uh, and I love people, uh, but I also have a son, and I also have a daughter. So I am called to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and my neighbor as myself. We all are. But when you have children... This is a little sweet spot, right? I mean, in your heart for, for family. doesn't mean you don't love other people, but there's this little sweet spot for just really loving on them when, when you hear from them. Like my little uh, uh, granddaughter the other day, she's a little Girl Scout, and she's because COVID's restricted where they can sell cookies and stuff. So uh, she's a new Girl Scout first year, and so she sent me a little cartoon animated emoji thing, and, and it came on there and said, Hi, Papa, this is Harper. I'm selling cookies. Would you like to buy some? Do you think I clicked off that thing? I'm looking at my wallet going, oh, man, how much money can I throw at this? You know, I mean, and I'm buying cookies left and right. I'm like, I'm not even going to eat them. Um, I love them, but I, at this point, you know what I'm saying, after, yeah, you can't eat them. Uh, but, but, but it's that whole thing. When you're thinking about God, he, he is near to those who call him. He's like a father. So if you are his child, he will hear you. And then he will move. Uh, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison for preaching the gospel, Luke 16. They're locked in a Roman prison. And God says, oh, I hear you're singing in your praises to me there. I'll send a localized earthquake, and I'll open the prison doors. I'll free everybody. And he did. See, that's, he heard him. But Hezekiah, when you think about Hezekiah, he's sick unto death. Um, Second Kings chapter 20, he prays for God to give him a four, few more years, and God did. He heard those prayers. But then when you think about it, Stephen first martyr of the church, is being stoned to death for preaching the word of God, uh, Acts 7. And did the Lord deliver him? No. But he did. Because as Stephen's being stoned, it says he looked up into heaven, had a face of an angel. He looks up into heaven, and God allows him to see in his dimension. And he see, it says, it says Jesus, he saw Jesus standing in glory. Oh. Whoa. He says, no, you're my son, and you're coming to heaven today. Uh, and I'm going to let you see me. And it's going to take away the sting of the stones. I'm going to allow you to see me. Think of that. I mean, think of that. It's just, it's just mind-boggling. So uh, when you think about God's praise, when he is focused on you as his child, and it is favorable, it's always favorable, no matter what he's doing. Six, says his care is just. His last point, his care is just. That's why you should praise him. It says the Lord keeps all of those who love him, but all of the wicked he will destroy. Uh, there's a balance here. Uh, he keeps. So does this mean if he keeps you, you'll never have hardship? I know you will, but he will keep you in the hardship. Uh, when something difficult comes your way, disease, job loss, whatever the difficulty is, you can't look at that and say, he's not going to keep me in this. Oh, no, as you get older, you can look back and go, he kept me in that. That's what it says. Uh, Isaiah 43, when Israel was... Uh, experiencing great national difficulty, God told the nation this. When you pass through the waters, I've been with people in many surgeries and read this text. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, though they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, uh, you will not be scorched, nor will a flame burn you. Why? Well, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Translated, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you in the middle of all of that. Why should we praise him? Because his care is always just toward his people. And there is the day when he will bring judgment. That's the word of the gospel. Christ paid for our sins on the cross, rose the third day to deliver us from his wrath. Those who come to him find forgiveness. If you reject him, you face his judgment. And he throws that in here at the end to remember he is just and he will bring judgment. Second Thessalonians 1, Paul says this. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you 
and to give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus, Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who don't know God and to those who don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And he will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints. There's a warning. He's patient with you now. But there comes the day when he deals with you. Uh, in China right now, um, they persecute Christians just off the grid. Uh, and the more, uh, because of COVID, uh, getting government assistance for basic necessities to live is, is tied to the government. The only problem is uh, this week they ordered uh, Christians to take down Jesus from their homes, pictures, and put pictures of uh, Mao, Chairman Mao, or Xi Jinping in Jesus' place. And if you don't do that, you don't get government assistance. Mind-boggling. There was one old lady in one province uh, when the government uh, officials brought her uh, care to the door for food, and et cetera, and when she received the care from the government, uh, she said, uh, thank you, God. And because of that, they took away her care. Why? Because she said, thank you, God. Amazing. I thought to myself, would I, would I praise God even in that? Yes, I, th I would hope so. I think I would. But even in that, uh, God's specialized care is keeping those saints. Because when there's hardship, saints will come together to do what they need to do to care for each other. So the church in uh, China is strong. And may the church in the States be strong because we, we serve a God who keeps us. How's this, how does the psalm close? I'm telling you what you should do in case you forgot. What's it say? Verse 21, you have a Bible. What's it tell you to do? My mouth, your mouth, put your name in there. will speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Why? Because you're created to do just one thing. Offer praise to him. So if it's 20 degrees when you get up this morning, I'm making it practical. You praise God. You don't have to wash the car today because it's 20 degrees. Yeah. Whatever happens today, tree falls in your yard, you know, takes out your garage, whatever, you walk out there and go, praise God. But whatever, whatever happens, we are created to praise him uh, because he's most praiseworthy in all things. Amen. Good to have you in God's house this morning. Let's praise him. Uh, God, we praise you. Uh, and too many of our prayers, Lord, are we waltz into your presence with a whole bunch of petitions and we forget to give praise to you. And maybe we should just make our prayers today just all about praise. Fill our minds with the things you've done in our life in a providential way to care for us as the king uh, and to protect us and equip us uh, to be witnesses to those about, those about us. We praise you for who you are. And may our lives, our facial expressions, our whole demeanor just reflect the joy we have of walking with the king of kings. Amen. Good to have you in God's house.